there are exactly 8 septillion, 401 sextillion, 905 quintillion, 440 quadrillion, 137 trillion, 617 billion, 408 million games of 3D tic-tac-toe. As a newly minted tic-tac-toe influencer, I've been hearing about quite a few variations of tic-tac-toe lately. There's the one where, after three moves, you take turns shifting your pieces around. The one in which you're allowed to play once outside the grid. The one where you have different sizes of X's and O's that can play on top of each other. There's different sized boards, different numbers of players, and boards within boards. In fact, it seems that there are an essentially infinite number of variations of tic-tac-toe. However, one question seems to come up again and again. Why does it have to be two-dimensional? Well, I set about to investigate, and after a disappointing foray into one-dimensional tic-tac-toe, I decided to set my sights on the third dimension. Now, if you've ever tried 3D tic-tac-toe, you've probably noticed a fundamental problem with the game. The very center square is just too powerful. No matter how your opponent responds, you can immediately put them on the defensive with one of the adjacent squares, after which you can use the third dimension to create a fork. So we need a way around this issue. Now, one way of solving the problem is simply to make the board bigger and require four in a row. As a kid, I had a 4x4x4 four 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 3D tic-tac-toe set, which worked pretty well. But who has the time to play a tic-tac-toe game with 64 different squares? No, after careful thought and a modest sponsorship deal with the developer of an app called Cube Tactics, I've come to the conclusion that the most satisfying solution is to outlaw the center square and play the game on the surface of the cube. Here's how Cube Tactics works. Players take turns coloring squares on the outside of a 3x3x3 cube, trying to get three in a row. But unlike regular tic-tac-toe, where the game ends after a successful line, here the game keeps going until every square is filled, with the winner being whoever makes the most lines. By default, when a line is made, those squares are now out of play. But there's also a mode where they stay in play, as well as other options like multiplayer. For this video though, I'll stick to the default settings. So how many games of this 3D version of tic-tac-toe are there? Well, you'd expect it to be significantly more than regular tic-tac-toe, since there are 26 available locations instead of 9. But how much more? In my first tic-tac-toe video, I began with the raw number 9 factorial, or 362,880, since there are 9 choices for the first move, each of which leads to 8 choices for the second move, and so on. If we do the same calculation for cube tactics, we arrive at a truly enormous number. 403 septillion, 291 sextillion, 461 quintillion, 126 quadrillion, 605 trillion, 635 billion, 584 million, which is 26 factorial. That's like a trillion billion times as many raw games as in 2D tic-tac-toe. In fact, it's roughly the same number of atoms in my big toe. Anyway, for regular tic-tac-toe, we managed to whittle down that 9 factorial considerably by considering symmetry and strategy. So what if we do the same here? Let's start with symmetry. At first it looks really promising. Instead of 26 possible first moves, there are really only three that are truly different. A corner, an edge, or a center. Say you pick one of the centers. Then instead of 25 possible responses to that move, symmetry can reduce that number to 7. But you might notice that 7 is more than 3, and it gets worse from there. That's the thing about symmetry. The further you go into the game, the more unique and asymmetrical the configurations become. So anyway, if you remember from my previous video, in 2D tic-tac-toe, accounting for symmetry reduced the number of games by a factor of 8, since there are 8 different rotations and reflections of the square. For a cube, on the other hand, there are 48 different reflections and rotations. To see this, remember that a cube has 6 different faces, any of which could be placed in front. Having chosen that face, there are now 4 different choices for the top face, at which point the orientation of the cube is fully determined. So that makes a total of 6 times 4, or 24 different rotations. Each of these rotations has a mirrored counterpart, bringing the total to 48. This means that we can reduce this enormous number of raw games by a factor of 48, bringing it down to a mere 8 septillion, 401 sextillion, 905 quintillion, 440 quadrillion, 137 trillion, 617 billion, 408 million games. Oh, and by the way, here's some extra details about that symmetry calculation that you might not care about. Anyway, clearly 8 septillion is still an astronomical number, so let's talk strategy. In the case of 2D tic-tac-toe, we could considerably reduce the number of games by assuming that players take and block winning moves. In cube tactics, though, this is a more dubious assumption, since the game doesn't end after someone gets three in a row. Still, I was curious how much the same assumption would reduce the number of possibilities here, so I coded up a simulation. 
And it turns out that if you assume people take and block three in a row when it presents itself, there are only 8,108,834 games of 3D tic-tac-toe after the first seven moves. Yeah, it took only seven moves for the number of possibilities to balloon to over 8 million, at which point my computer was taking so long to calculate the eighth move that I gave up on it. Okay, but what if you make the even more dubious assumption that players always attempt to get two in a row when three in a row is not available? Well, in that case, my program made it to the 16th move before it couldn't handle it anymore. So at this point, I clearly needed a different approach. Not only did these strategies um, fail to pare down the number of games to something manageable, but I suspected that they were also just bad strategies. Since the game isn't over after the first player gets three in a row, it might be better to pay attention to your overall position rather than short-sightedly completing the first line that becomes available. Which brings us to the board position evaluation function. To approach the game in a more holistic way, let's consider all of the possible lines that can be made on the surface of a 3x3x3 three by three by three cube. Since the very center of the cube is off limits, there are eight possible lines parallel to the x-axis, eight possible lines parallel to the y-axis, and eight parallel to the z-axis. In addition to these 24 lines, there are 12 diagonal lines, two for each face of the cube. So a natural way of evaluating our position is to consider how close we are to completing each of these 36 lines compared with our opponent. Take this position, for instance. The blue player has one line two-thirds of the way completed, and four lines one-third of the way completed. Red simply has two lines one-third of the way completed. Notice also that several lines have been spoiled for both opponents. I wrote a function to calculate a score based on these statistics, which gives completed lines a value of one, lines with two out of three scores completed a value of one-third, and lines with just one score completed a value of one-seventh. These coefficients were chosen so that it's a little better to have one completed line than two almost completed lines, and it's a little better to have one almost completed line than two that are just started. Also, note that the coefficients are positive for player one, blue, and negative for player two, red. This means that if the total score is positive, blue is in the better position, and if the total score is negative, red is in the better position. Going back to our example, if we plug in the values for red and blue, we arrive at a value of positive 13 over 21, or roughly 0.619, indicating that blue has the better position. Now that we have a function for evaluating the state of the board, we can see what happens if both players simply pick the move or moves that give them the best position score. Again, I ran a simulation, and it turns out that if both players play with such a strategy, there are 137,880 different games of cube tactics. That's still a lot, but less than the population of medieval Paris. Let's take a look at how one of these games plays out. Um. Interestingly, while I can't claim that it's the optimal strategy, this more holistic approach does consistently outperform the greedy approaches that take the first lines available to them. At this point, if you've seen my previous video, you may be wondering, could we use a minimax algorithm to determine the perfect strategy? As a quick refresher, the idea of a minimax algorithm is that at any given point in the game, it considers every possible branch leading from that point, playing it out until the end of the game. It then picks the branch or branches that will lead to the best outcome, assuming the opponent also plays optimally. Quick aside, I made a poster of the visual you're looking at right now, along with a bunch of other ridiculous punny merch, so you can check out the link to that and the silly announcement video that went with it in the description. Anyway, you probably already guessed what the problem is with trying to write a minimax algorithm for cube tactics. The size of the game tree is completely prohibitive. However, what we can do is limit the depth of search to only a few moves into the future, thereby keeping the size of the tree more manageable. The only problem is, since we don't make it to the end of the game, we don't have a way of knowing which paths lead to victory or defeat. So how can we judge which paths are good and which are bad? Well, we can use our board position evaluation function, of course. This approach isn't perfect like the minimax algorithm from my previous video, but in a way it's mimicking the way human beings play games. While we generally can't think through every possibility all the way to the end of the game, we do often try to think a few moves ahead and pick a move that will lead to a favorable outcome. And perhaps what it really means to be a master of a game is to have optimized your ability to search through the game tree so that you can look deeper into the future, and also to be skilled at recognizing favorable mid-game positions, the way that our board position evaluation function is trying to do. So what happens if we try to count the number of games of cube tactics that are possible between players using this kind of look-ahead? 
Now, remember that there were 137,880 different games between players just using the board position evaluation function to pick their next move. If we instead use a look ahead of two games, there are now 264,533 games. And if we look ahead by three moves, there are now 2,468,557 games? Clearly we're going in the wrong direction, with more games rather than fewer. What this suggests to me is that a player who's able to look ahead a little is actually able to see a wider range of choices that are all equally good. Remember that for regular tic-tac-toe, where we could feasibly chart out the entire tree of possible games, there were hundreds of different ways in which two perfect minimax players could reach a draw. For cube tactics, which as we've seen has hundreds of septillions of games, there may be billions of optimal ways to play. At this point, having considered several different approaches a human or AI player might take to cube tactics, the natural next step was to pit them against each other in a grand battle royale. For example, if player one plays randomly while player two greedily completes three in a row at the first opportunity, we end up with a game like this. Or how about if player one plays using minimax with a three-step look ahead, and player two simply plays to maximize their immediate board position. Ultimately, I ran thousands of trials for each pair of strategies, and came up with this chart. For each combination of strategies, the blue fill represents the proportion of games in which player one was victorious, the red, how often player two was victorious, and the gray, how often it was a tie game. A few interesting patterns pop out. First, player one seems to have an advantage over player two, but not uniformly and not to a huge extent. Second, and this was sort of gratifying because it suggests I didn't screw up, the minimax players with more look ahead tended to beat those with less look ahead. However, interestingly, the minimax players don't do quite as well against random players as less sophisticated AIs do. Perhaps because there's an assumption that they're playing against an equal. One thing that all of the position maximizing strategies have in common is that they start with the corner. And if you think about it for a second, you'll see why. A corner gets you started on six different possible lines, whereas a center lies on only four, and an edge a mere two. So come on, at this point, you know you have to give cube tactics a shot. Like tic-tac-toe, it's a short, simple game with easy to understand rules. But unlike tic-tac-toe, it's interesting to play, with no obvious best strategy that works for all opponents. Oh, and the handcrafted AI built into the game is actually pretty decent. I wouldn't be surprised if it beats you. It certainly beat me a few times. So check out the links in the description and let me know how you did in the comments. And with that, I'll play you out the only way I know how, with tic-tac-toe sonifications. Thank you.